غفر الله لكم الثانية. رزقنا الله وإياكم شفاعة الحسين وآل الحسين الثالثة بأعلى أصواتكم. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين وشفيع المظلمين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وتبيب نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد ثم الصلاة والسلام على أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المذنوبين المنتجبين لا سيما مولانا وسيدي صاحب العصر والزمان روحي وعرواه العالمين له الخداع وأجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف ولانة الدائمة ولا عدائهم ومنكر فذائلهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد بشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل عقدة من لساني يفقه كوني for the hastening of the return of our 12th Imam, Imam Al-Hujjah, wa salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. As we continue on in this month of Muharram, where we commemorate the supreme sacrifice of Allah Abdullah al Hussein and his family and companions on the plains of Karbala over 1300 years ago, this evening we continue on in our discussion and our review of the supplication which has been taught to us by our 12th Imam Imam al hujjah in which as we mentioned on the very first night is not only a supplication, a dua that will ask Allah for metaphysical assistance, for a supernatural support in how we can transform our lives. But more importantly that this supplication teaches us lessons that we need to instill on our own. Things that the Imam is expecting from us, his companions, his supporters, and things that we have to imbibe within ourselves to be thought of and to be worthy of being amongst the camp of Imam al hujjah Up until this point, we've been looking at a few of the traits that the Imam has been requesting from us. And we continue tonight in another line of this very famous supplication taught to us by the 12th Imam in which he says, he asks for two certain things that we should be imbibing within ourselves. And he says, He says that we should be asking and we should be seeking for ourselves, for our heart, our spiritual heart, this vessel, this container, to be filled with knowledge and ma'rifat, knowledge and a deeper understanding. Now when we look at the world that we live in today, and obviously when we reflect on the history of Islam, coming from the fact that Islam was started, was initiated in a society where literally before the time of the advent of Rasulullah that you could count the number of people who were literate on the fingers of one hand. The time of the Jahli Arabs, it was not a time of knowledge, it was not a time of expertise in the world sciences. It was at that time when people had no concept or had no value of knowledge that Rasulullah comes with this magnificent miracle, the Qur'an. And out of all of the topics that Allah could begin the Qur'an with, with the millions of words and concepts that Allah could initiate His holy book with, He sends Rasulullah revelation where He says, Iqra, to read or to recite. And from that instance, from that day forward, this religion began to be known as a religion of knowledge. It was a religion, a way of life, a set of teachings, which promoted literacy within its followers. And this is clear when you study Islamic history, that by the time of the Prophet, knowledge became the key for many different things. If you were a prisoner of war, you're captured in battle, but you knew how to read and write, your freedom could be bought by you teaching a number of Muslims how to read and write. And this tradition went on for 23 years. 
in which Allah would bring forth ayat, would bring verses in the Quran to speak about the importance of knowledge. Many verses Allah tells us, for example, Allah takes an oath, He says, Nun, wa ma Allah takes an oath by the pen and what the pen writes. Allah tells us in the Quran, Hal ya'lamun la ya'lamun. Can two people, one who knows, who has knowledge, can he or she ever be equal to somebody who has no knowledge? It's impossible. Even in our world today, if you have a person who's graduated from university with a degree, they're a master's, they're a PhD, you can't compare that person to somebody who is a garbage collector, who's a trash collector, who didn't go to school. They're both human beings, definitely. They both deserve respect. But they're not on an equal level because one has knowledge. The one person has studied 10, 15, 20 years. The other one hasn't had that opportunity. So tonight I want to look at this topic of each one teach one. The importance of knowledge within the tradition of Islam. And especially as followers of Ahlul Bayt How does this concept of knowledge fit into our world ethos and our outlook on the world today? And what do the Ahlul Bayt tell us about the importance of seeking knowledge? What kind of knowledge is it? Because in this du'a from the 12th Imam, he's ambiguous. He doesn't specify what kind of knowledge. He just says, fill our hearts with knowledge, with ilm and ma'rifah. He doesn't say what form of knowledge we should be looking to take in. He doesn't specify the form of knowledge or what subject it is. So inshallah, we try to look into this and try to better understand what the 12th Imam wants from us with one salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. And the topic for tonight obviously is for all of us men and women, so hopefully we are all paying attention. Because this supplication that we have tonight and that we've been going over these nights is not just for the brothers, for the men. Islam is a universal religion, it's for all of us. And the words of the Ahlul Bayt they are for all of us. The Imam says, You know, in English we have a saying where we say that knowledge is power. I, you know, actually when I was looking at the saying, knowledge is power, I realized that Amir al-Mu'mineen actually has the exact same sentence. If you look in the Sharh of Najul Balagha from Ibn Abi al-Hadid, he quotes a hadith from Amir al-Mu'mineen where the commander says, Al-ilmu sultan, that knowledge is power. And you look at the world today that we live in, and really the world is governed by knowledge. People who have knowledge, they are the ones who are the decision makers of the world today. The people that run think tanks in Washington, in New York, maybe in Australia, in London. These are people who are educated individuals and they control the way the world functions. You know, it's not just politicians, presidents, governments, heads of state that run the world. They may run the affairs of the country and that in a limited basis, but ultimately it's those individuals at the top echelons of the society who have gotten that knowledge who control the way the world works today. And so when the religion of Islam came and stressed on the importance of knowledge, it did so knowing for a fact that you have knowledge, you control the way the world runs. You control the narrative of the world. You control who is a friend, who is a foe. Today, if you look at the way the media works, right, and media is so much of a robust topic nowadays, the media is not just satellite or television or radio. Today the media is in the palm of our hand. Today we don't need television stations because we have phones. And all of the major websites, you can stream live on that site. So you and I now make up the media of the world. And when we have that ability, we have the power also to change public opinion for the better or for the worse. And so knowledge becomes very important for us to 
be able to delve into, to see how it is that we can use these tools to further our objectives, to further our cause. As I said, that there are many ayat of the Quran that speak about knowledge. There are tens of verses that talk about the importance of seeking knowledge. And when we go to the hadith of the Prophet, the sayings of Rasul and the family of the Prophet, we see that the Prophet really left no stone, stone unturned. He told us, for example, that there is no time limit. Seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave. You know, there should never be a time in our life where we are not on a pursuit of knowledge. It doesn't mean that you are officially in a university or a, or a seminary or officially engaged in knowledge seeking. There are multiple ways to gain knowledge. The Prophet even didn't leave it to a geographic location. He said, seek knowledge even if you have to travel to China. He didn't mean literally China. Some scholars say that he was referring to the furthest most known point on earth at his time that people recognized as a seat of knowledge. Today, from the comfort of our own home, we can study and get a university degree. We can study theology, we can study courses that are offered in the Hawza al in in, at, at home without having to travel. The point being here is that knowledge should never, you know, all of these impediments, age, distance, should never become a barrier in us and the seeking of knowledge. To show us how important knowledge is in fact, even when we look in our books of hadith, in all of the books of hadith that we have, there are always chapters dedicated to the seeking of knowledge. And there are multiple hadith which give us different explanations of this importance within our lives. To give us just one example, in the very famous book of Hadith Al-Kafi, in the very first book, after Sheikh Kulaini talks about the introduction and he brings up some hadith on the first section, section number two is about the merits of ilm. Fadlul ilm is the name of the bab of that chapter of Al-Kafi. And he brings forth a very interesting hadith that I want to narrate at the beginning. He quotes one of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt as saying the following. He says, Ayyuha nas O humanity, O people. He says, I'lamu anna kamalu deen talabul ilm wal amalu bihi. Know and understand that the perfection, the completion of religion, it lies in seeking knowledge and acting upon that knowledge. This is the first key in humanity in our life, is knowledge needs to be a key driving force within our lives. But not only knowledge, because if you ask people today, many people have knowledge. Google has knowledge. You can ask Sheikh Google any question you want. It has more knowledge than the greatest of scholars in the world today. But it's only knowledge, it's just facts, it's just figures. And so the Imam says it's about knowing, seeking the knowledge, and acting upon it. And that is a challenge because many times we learn about Islam. We learn our responsibilities, but we don't practice it. What benefit is there to know and not practice? There's very little benefit in it. And that's why we see in the, in the religion of Islam, it's always about both of those combined. Seek knowledge and practice. Follow what you learn, know and practice what you've learned. And once we learn, learn something and we practice it, then we go forth and try to learn even more. So the Imam says, understand that Kamaluddin, the perfection of your religion, the pinnacle of your faith is to learn knowledge and then to implement it in our daily lives. And then he says, Allah wa inna talibul ilm awjabu alaykum min talibil mal. Seeking knowledge is more of an obligation upon you and I than seeking wealth. It's important to go to work. It's important to earn a livelihood. We have to maintain, we have to earn money, we have to run these centers, we have families to maintain, we have vacations we want to go on to, we want to you know, do a lot of things. But he says that seeking knowledge is even more important than seeking money. Now why would that be? He gives us a part of the answer. He says, in al your wealth, he says, maksumun, 
mazmunun lakum. The wealth that you and I will earn in our lives is guaranteed to us by Allah. Anybody who comes into this world, every human being that is born in this world, their wealth is guaranteed by Allah. As long as they fulfill the minimum requirements, whatever you and I have been guaranteed by Allah, we will get. Not a dollar more, not a dollar less. So our wealth is guaranteed to reach us. Obviously we fulfill our requirements and Allah will fulfill His part of the bargain. So he says, Maksumun Madhmumun. And then he says, Tarkasamahu Adilun Bainakum. That this has been distributed amongst all of us. It doesn't mean that we'll all be at the same level. Today we have Muslims who are multimillionaires, who are billionaires. And then we have some who are barely making ends meet. All of us have been given what we have been given because of a certain rationale that Allah only knows. For some people to have wealth is not a bounty or a blessing, it is a test from Allah. It's a way for Allah to examine them. Will they perform their obligation? Will they pay their homes when it comes due? Will they give to the needy? Will they help the centers? Will they help in the promotion of Islam? Having money is not a blessing from Allah. Sometimes having money can be a curse from Allah. Because when you have it, now you have a greater responsibility with Allah. So he says it's guaranteed to reach us. And then he says, But knowledge is a hidden treasure with those who possess it. And he says that you have been ordered You've been ordered to seek knowledge from the people of knowledge, so go forth and seek that knowledge. So we see that the Ahlul Bayt have told us in many, many traditions that knowledge is the key, it's the treasure, it's that secret component to the life of a believer, to us, for us to progress, to move forward in our societies, we need to go down this path of seeking knowledge. But people may wonder, what kind of knowledge is the Imam talking about? He says in that dua, Fill my heart with ilm and ma'rifah, with knowledge and cognizance. But he left it open-ended. He didn't say knowledge of religion, knowledge of science, knowledge of medicine, business, accounting, what did the Imam mean? And what do the hadith that come to us, the statements of the Prophet and Ahlul Bayt what do they mean when they talk about knowledge? We have to understand here, brothers and sisters, that when we are talking about this, that it can refer to any form of knowledge first and foremost. None of us should be thinking that it's only for one gender, or one age group, or one specific field of knowledge. It's open-ended. It, it, it should relate to all of us and to all fields of knowledge. But the one thing I do want to mention and stress on the fact is that when we go forth to attain that knowledge, whether it be of the sacred or the knowledge of the profane, knowledge of the world or knowledge of religion, is the one thing that each and every one of us, young and old, male and female, the one thing that we should be thinking about is how would that knowledge help the cause of Islam and how would it benefit the time of our 12th Imam? Everything that we do in life, literally, we should be doing it with that thought in mind that when the Imam returns, what will he use me to do within society? And then when I use that thought in my mind, then I should go forth to university, to college, whatever I want to do, and think of that career path that will benefit the Imam. What will he need in his society? You know, we hear these traditions about the time of the Zuhur of the Imam, and those 313 who will begin to accompany the Imam, 50 of which are women in the first ranks of the Imam. What will they be doing with the Imam? Will they just be, you know, sitting around, drinking tea, talking to the Imam, having fun? No, they will be planning the movement for the transformation of society. They'll be planning with the Imam 
how to bring about this system of governance, of justice, of equality upon the earth. And so when we look at what we need for knowledge, we have to realize that whatever we study, whatever we do, how does that relate back to the 12th Imam? How can he use me as a conduit to transform the society at that time? So yes, the Imam will need people in the field of medicine. When he comes, he won't necessarily cure the people who are sick by magic, by miracles. He will use the necessary means at his disposal. Will he need engineers? Probably, because he'll be building infrastructure for the society. He won't just snap his fingers and a building will pop up. He would need engineers to construct the society, to build the buildings that will run his government. He'll need people in so many different fields. He'll need people in fields like art and design. You know, today when we look at the world of, of the Muslim community, we have people who are great in medicine, who are in computer programming, who are engineers. But then you look for people who are graphic artists, who can draw cartoons, who can make animations, who can make movies, and we don't have them. Or if we do, they're very few and far between. We look for Muslims who are in the media, who are on television, who are giving a proper name to Islam, and we see that there are very few people within our community, globally, in the Western world, who are involved in media. There are so many areas where as a community we're lacking in terms of that knowledge. And if we reflect on the fact that when the 12th Imam returns, that his revolution will be one which is based on natural means, he will need people to make documentaries, to make movies, to make cartoons, to write books, to create media that we will consume at that time. And so all of these areas, if we do them with the intention that we are working towards a better society for when the 12th Imam returns, then all of these become areas of interest and importance that the 12th Imam will use. But in addition to that, because at one level, yes, it's important to have experts in the world today. We need people working at the highest levels in business, in the universities, but we can't forget the fact that as a community, we are a religious community. We're a community that have a specific religion that we follow. We have certain principles that we adhere to. We have a set of conduct that we follow. And that comes back down to our religion and the teachings of Muhammad and Al Muhammad alayhi wa salatu wa salam. And whereas it is important to go to university, to become professionals in all of these fields, I would say tonight it is as important for us as a community to have religious scholars from within our own community. We need to have people from every community in the world producing their own scholars. We need to have scholars from Australia, from Canada, from America, from European countries. Because we will come to a point in our growth in these societies where the importation of scholars will not suffice. You know, as a community, and I speak from one who is from Canada, when our forefathers came from back home, from whatever country they came, and they settled in Canada, it was a new land, it was a new society. The food was different, the environment was different, the climate was different. And so the pioneers, the forefathers of those communities, they began to bring things from home. They brought food, they brought spices, they brought the clothing they wore back at home. And yes, with that, they brought their scholars also from back home. So they would feel like they were back home again. And there was, that's not a problem because those were the formative years of growing our societies. But now that we've been in the Western world for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years maybe or more in certain parts of the world, we realize that to know and understand these cultures, it calls for somebody who has spent 
a considerable, considerable amount of time growing up in this part of the world. And so when we come to knowledge, and the Imam says, Fill my heart with knowledge and this cognizance, it also has to be that we send our own to go to the Hawza of Najaf or Qum or wherever to study Islamic studies and come back to be scholars of religion in our communities. And I would say this, that it is no difference for the men or for the women. In fact, I would say that for the women, for the sisters of our community, it is more of an obligation, it is more important for them to be experts in religion. In fact, as we know that when our, when our women, when they become mothers and their children come into the world, it is the mother that brings up our children. It's the mother, where the, it's the lap of the mother in which the children learn about Islam. It's in the laps of our wives, of our mothers, that the children are nourished for the love of Ahlul Bayt salam. Had it not been for our mothers nurturing us, we would not be in the majlis of Sayyidah Shuhada tonight. And so when the mothers are the prime caregivers in those formative years, if they don't know Islam, if they don't know the basics and they don't know the depths of religion, how will they be able to convey this to those children that they are nurturing, that they are feeding, that they are bringing up? And so we have to realize that as a community, we have to ensure that we support the youth, the young women and young men who want to go forth and study knowledge, who want to study in the Hawza. We have to have endowment funds, we have to have money available to them that they can go and study and be comfortable, not worry how will they pay the rent, how will they afford this, you know, the living and cost of, it, of living overseas. These should never be issues. And every society, every city should send young men and women, fund them, support them, encourage them, give them the assistance they need, that they're able to complete 5, 10, 15, 20 years of religious studies and come back and be the guides and the beacons for our communities. You know, it's interesting when you look at the, the world even today, this institution of Majalis of Muharram that we have around the world, in every country that you look at, you go on Facebook and you'll see that in every city probably where there is a large concentration of followers of the Ahlul Bayt salam, you'll have 5, 10, 15, 20 lectures a night. This sheikh from this country, this sayyid, this scholar from here, this one from there. But the one thing that stands out in all of them, or a majority, is that they are all men. They're only men who are lecturing in Muharram, for a majority of it. Where are the women scholars who are delivering majalis lectures for the women? Where are the mujtahidas, the female mujtahids, that the women can go to for guidance? Where are the scholars of the feet from, the, from the opposite gender who are giving lectures to the women? For the most part, and we do have scholars who have graduated, who are lecturing, who are teaching, but for the most part, the most of the lectures are done by men. And so we have to realize that although Islam is one, and gender doesn't play a role in submission to Allah, but at the same time, women also need to play an active role. And that means that we as a community have to encourage our daughters, our women, our sisters to go forth and get, get that Islamic knowledge, to gain the knowledge and come back and teach those who are within the communities. And really sometimes, you know, as men, we don't understand women. Really, most of you are probably married 20, 30, 40 years, and you'll still say, I still don't know my wife. I still don't know how a woman functions, how she thinks. Because Allah has wired us differently. A man, we think in a different way. We react in a different way. Our emotions are a different way. Women are different. They're created in a different fashion. Allah has given them things which we as men don't have. They have subtleties in their character that we men don't have. And so women need to be there to support, to help, to teach, to educate themselves, to help themselves to overcome these challenges 
and to better understand their role within the religion of Islam and also their role in the time of the time of our 12th Imam and what role that they will play in the advent of Imam al-Hujjah Ajal Allah Ta'ala Farjahu Sharif Salu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad One last part and I'll, one last point I'll end with this for tonight about the importance of knowledge is that sometimes people say that, and this is based on a, a saying in English, that ignorance is bliss. What you don't know can't hurt you. Maybe we've heard this before. These people will say, you know what, it's better if I don't know something. Because if I don't know, then I'm not obligated to do it. But really, when you think about it, and I've been thinking about this a lot of times, that in the world that we live in today, that is a fallacy. To say that ignorance is bliss is not right. Why? If you don't know that the speed limit is 60 kilometers an hour, and you're driving 140 down the road, and the officer stops you, or the red light camera takes your picture, and sends you the ticket in the mail, you can't tell the police or the judge, I didn't know the speed limit. Even if you do tell them, what will they say? Well, they'll say, well, ignorance of the law is no excuse. Just because you don't know the speed limit is 60 or 80 or 110, and you break the law, it doesn't absolve you of the responsibility. You still got to pay the price. You still have to pay that ticket. So ignorance is not bliss in the world. If you don't know the rules of the country, let's say in, in terms of taxation, then you can't benefit from the system because you don't know where the legal loopholes are within the system to make the maximum benefit of the taxation rules of your country. So not knowing the rules and taxation will not benefit you. It's actually a detriment. And so that's why we spend thousands of dollars to pay our accountants to do our taxes because they know the system, they can navigate and they can get us the most money back from the government. Again, ignorance is not bliss. Islam is the same. When you look at the religion of Islam, the rules that our maraja put forth, when they write a book, it's like a thousand page book of Islamic laws. You know, you look at it and you think, man, that's a lot of stuff to read. Do I really need to read all of these rules of my maraja? Well, no, you don't need to know all of them. Obviously, if you're not a fisherman, if you're not a hunter, you don't need to know the rules of fishing or hunting. If you don't dive into the ocean and find pearls and gems, you don't need to study that section of ahkam of the fiqh. But we pray every day, five times a day. We need to know, well, what if I make a mistake? If I don't know how to correct my problem in the state of salat, I might just start praying again. Whereas there may have been a shortcut for me to, re, to repay that prayer back to Allah, but not by going through the entire prayer again. So knowing the rules of Salat don't make it more difficult, it makes it easier for me. I'll give you another prime example. Is that in social interaction, we know that our Maraja have rules and opinions about the Taharat and Najasat. Certain things are pure, certain things are impure. They tell us that even humanity, human beings, Muslims, Ahl al-Kitab, the people of the book, they have a certain ruling. And non-Ahl al-Kitab, they have a different ruling. Majority of maraja have this. Certain scholars may differ, but the mainstream marja'iyat, they will have a separate ruling for people of the book and non-people of the other traditions. Now, the challenge comes, we live in a society, a multicultural society, how do you know who is Ahlul Kitab and who is not? If you're going to think that everybody is a non-Muslim, a non-Ahlul Kitab, then your life becomes very difficult living in these Western societies. Because how do you deal with issues of Taharat and Najasa? Because you don't know. Will you presume everybody to be impure? Obviously that would cause life to be impossible in this society. And so when you look at the Risala of the Maraja, and all of these, or majority of them have this ruling, where they tell us that when you live in a society, and you are a mixed community, Muslim and non-Muslim, you presume everybody to be Muslim, or Ahlul Kitab, 
unless you know for sure that there is some indicator that they're not. When you realize that that's the rule that the maraja gives, then it doesn't make life difficult. Because now you know how to deal when you come across situations in your life. You're not wondering, how do I clean this? How do I do that? How do I fix this problem? Because when you deem everybody to be within Islam or of the Ahlul Kitab, it makes life much more easier to live. And so when we study the rules, we gain that knowledge. When we ask Allah and we seek knowledge of the world and of religion, it makes our life easier to lead in this society and it gives us an opportunity to be able to live life freely with not less constraints and less limitations, but actually much more freedom. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. These nights of Muharram, as we know we're on the third night tonight, and we're getting closer to the day of Ashura. And obviously as these nights begin to grow, and we get closer and closer to the night of Ashura, we get closer and closer to that closer you know, affinity and affection for the day of Ashura and the tragedy of Karbala. But for Sayyid al 1300 years ago, he was looking at the day of Ashura probably in a different way. The books of Maktal tell us that between the second day and the third day of Muharram, on the second day we're told is when the camp of Sayyid al-Shuhada, when they had reached to the land of Karbala. As we know that Sayyid al-Shuhada changed his Hajj into the Umrah and he left Mecca on around the 8th of Dhul Hijjah. On the 2nd of Muharram, so about 20 days of traveling, they land and they arrive in the land of Karbala on the 2nd of Muharram. And we're told in the books of history that when the camp reaches to this desert, because it wasn't a city at that time like today, when the camp reaches to that land, they spend the one day there outside in the desert. And the people who lived in the area, they came to see who these people were. And when the Sayyid al-Shuhada introduced himself, he asked the people the question, he says, what is the name of this land that we're on? And some people said it's called Ghadiriya. He says, does this land have another name? Some said, yes, we also call it Nainawa. And then he said, well, does it have another name? And then when he was told, yes, we also call this land Karbala. And that's when Imam Hussein says that, he says, I seek refuge in Allah from Karb and Bala. I seek protection in Allah from difficulties and tribulations. He tells the Ahlul Bayt on that day, the third of Muharram, he says, come off the horses, come off the mounts, because it is on this land of Karbala that we will encamp. This is that land in which our blood will be shed. This is that land where we'll be cut into pieces. This is that land of Karbala where the women will be taken captives and they will be taken from city to city at the end of this tragedy. On the third day of Muharram, in that year 61 after the Hijrah, after Imam Hussain had camped in Karbala, one of the first things that he did according to the books of Maktal is he asked the people who owned that land that he wanted to buy that land from them. And the historian said that he bought it for 60,000 dirham. He bought the land, but then he did something unique. He bought the land for himself, for his own grave but he gifted it back to the people who owned it with the condition that they allow the Zawar who come, that they would guide the Zawar to his grave where he's buried. He gave them two conditions. He says, I'm giving you back the land. You can keep it, but I want you to give my Zawar the, the, to let them know where I'm buried. And he says, allow them, me, you be their host for three days. Give them food, give them shelter, take care of them. And on that third day, brothers and sisters, and I'll conclude with this, this is also when the enemy forces of Umar, of Umar ibn Asad, where he begins to amass the army around Sayyid al-Shuhada. As we know that the army of Hur had intercepted Imam Hussein at that land of Karbala. And he stopped Imam Hussein from moving forward towards Kufa. 
Eventually on the third day, the forces of Ibn Sa'ad come and we're told that 3,000 soldiers accompany him. Not just 3,000 soldiers, but 3,000 mounted soldiers on horseback, ready to shed the blood of Sayyidina Shuhada on that day. Many discussions go back and forth. Enemies from the camp of Umar ibn Sa'ad come to Sayyidina Shuhada. One individual actually is planning to threaten to kill Imam Hussein. That plan does not go through. But eventually, the historians say that with the camp of Abu Abdullah on one side, on the other side, there are over 3,000 soldiers who are waiting and ready to take their orders and to shed the blood of Abu Abdullah. Brothers and sisters, it was on this third day that Imam Hussain realizes that at this point there is no turning back. He can't go back home to Medina. He can't go back, he can't go forth to Kufa. He's basically trapped in this location and that time will only tell that he will eventually meet the fate that he had been foretold of by his grandfather Rasulullah and that his father Amir al-Mu'mineen had also explained to him that would happen on this day. We ask Allah to accept this act of worship from us tonight. We ask Allah to give us the shafa'at of Hussein on the day of judgment. We ask Allah to hasten in the return of our 12th Imam, Imam al hujjah We ask Allah for the return of the Imam to eradicate oppression and tyranny from around the world. We ask Allah to protect all of the lovers of Abu Abdullah Hussein around the world. And He gives them the safety and the tranquility that they deserve as the lovers of Hussein. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta samir alim. Let us conclude by reciting a surah al-Fatiha for the thawab of all the deceased from our community, our family, our friends, the ulama, the shuhada who have left this world. But before that, one loud salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Oh.